Where are they now? Interesting question. We talked a little bit last week um, about how we, uh, we know that the place that the Bible talks about over in Revelation with the streets of gold and the pearly gates and the, uh, the uh, crystal sea and, and all that stuff, that, that is not until after the rapture, after the second coming, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, after the great white throne judgment, after the thousand year millennial reign. Then this new heaven and new earth comes down that John describes. So if they're not there, if they're not on the streets of gold, where are they? If they're not in that place that John describes yet, where are they? And we're going to take it from a uh, very uh, familiar scripture, Luke chapter 16, is where we'll be at. And uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody here has heard the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus. And I believe using this, <laughs> this text will be able to determine where folks are now. Still some questions that we can't answer, um, and, and we'll kind of look at that. Uh, but there, there's some really, really cool stuff in here. Uh, let's read this first. I'm going to slide this over so I can see it for a minute. Luke 16, begin reading verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple. Oh, let's stand. Sorry. 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, and he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, lest, or they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So again, we're going to be looking at revealing the mysteries of heaven. Where are they now? Let's be seated. Lord, again, as we get into your word, Father, we pray that you'll give us the words that you'd have us to say. Teach us something tonight, Father. Uh, and encourage us and prick our hearts, Father. We'll give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, there is an epitaph that is written on a tombstone over in Indiana. Uh, anybody that knows anything about David Jeremiah knows he loves epitaphs. That's one of his things. He loves to get these things off the tombstones. And, uh, he was telling about this one. Uh, it's over 100 years old, but this is what it reads. Paul's stranger when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you were on my dad, run funeral homes uh, all of my life. Um, we lived in funeral homes for 20 some years. Um, so we spent a lot of time in funeral homes. Two things people always want to know. Where are they and what are they doing? When, when somebody dies, where are they and what are they doing? And we're going to kind of look at that. Um, there is a... Uh, they were telling too about a there's a, a new thing it's called a 
I forget what, what title of it is, but it's a telegram service for the dead. And what it is is these people that are terminally ill, they sign a contract to deliver a message when they get to the other side. And then in the small print it says, uh, now we cannot guarantee that. Now we know he wasn't asleep. We know he was dead. Four days he was in the grave. He was dead. Just a term to means, uh, sleepeth means to, to be dead. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Um, how about Stephen? Remember the story of Stephen? Uh, when Stephen was stoned. When they threw stones at him. No, he was stoned. They threw stones and killed him. Our terminology nowadays kind of get out of whack. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. One more, David. Acts 13. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was laid into his fathers and saw corruption. So to fall asleep means to die. Where are they now? Obviously, if we go by a cemetery, we know that the body is in the grave. Uh, we know that. We've, we've seen that enough. We've seen them in the coffins. We've seen them put down in the ground. We've seen all that. Um, but if I go out here and I get in my car and, and I'm driving to work and I'm going down 85 and I'm putting on and my car dies on me. It breaks down. And that's happened to me before. Anybody else ever broke down on the side of the road? We broke down on the side of the road. Car breaks down the side of the road. I pull up on the side of the road. I get emergency lane. I hit my emergency flashers and I try to start it. It ain't going nowhere. After a few minutes, you go, I don't talk. The car's dead. Okay? Now, when I open the door and I step out of the car and shut the door, do I cease to exist? No. All I have done is transferred from one place to another place. All I did was leave the mobile transportation that I was in to another reality. And when we die... All we do is leave this transportation automobile, this cardiac Cadillac that we've got, and when it dies, we get out of this vehicle and we go somewhere else. Where do we go? What happens after that? We're going to look at three things. Two people, two places, and two principles. Two people, two places, two principles. Real easy to follow. A lot of this you go, you've heard before, uh, but we're going to go through it real quick. And we got to go through it real quick, or we'll be here all day. Now, two people. We know it's Lazarus. We know it's the rich man. And, and kind of what we're going to do is we're going to put a split screen. And, and we're going to have one on one side and one on the other side. And we're going to contrast these two individuals about what happens in their life, in their death, and in their eternity. All right? So we, we start with their life first, contrasted in life. Uh, we see these two men. Let's read these verses. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. We see that about the rich man. This man had a good life. This man was living it up. This word sumptuously means to be flamboyant. He, he, was, he was outwardly wealthy. He, wasn't just, he didn't just have money. He showed that he had money. He let everybody know that he had money. Uh, he, he, he was a very wealthy, dressed very nice, drove the best camels around, <laughs> you know, whatever they had back then. He had everything nice. All right? So he, he's on one side, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Here's a man who is not only sick, but he's hungry. The rich man is, is over here, and he's got servants, and he's got uh, wealth, and he's got food, and he's got transportation. He's got all the stuff that he, he needs to get by with. And, and then over here, you've got this, 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 this sick guy that's hungry, and all he's got is dogs. I mean, the, the rich man could have sent one of his servants to dress up the wounds and the sores, but all he had was dogs to lick his sores. All he did was 
uh, be dropped off every day at the rich man's house so that he could beg for crumbs to eat. We see that a lot out here on the road. Some of them's fake. Some of them's real. Some people out there are really in need of help. This was these two men in life. Contrasted in life. Then we look at two people contrasted in death. I didn't get them papers. They're sitting there on my desk. Mm -hmm. Nah, that's all right. Everybody. Contrasted in death. Let's read on. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. You'll notice there's no burial of the rich of, of the Lazarus. It just says that he died. The angels came and they carried him to Abraham's bosom. Why is that? Because in those days they didn't bury poor folk. When they were beggars and they uh, did not have money or own property or anything of that nature, they went to one of two places. They either threw them in the potter's field or they threw them in a place called Gehenna, which outside the second uh, if you studied the Jewish culture, they would hire people to just come in and cry for you. Uh, you know, I, I never understood that. Why well, can't your family cry for you? Uh, but he, uh, they would have all these mourners come in, and they would have this grand funeral. They would bury him with all this grandeur and all these uh, jewels and all these gold things and everything. Um, they sit in, in, in my preaching or teaching either one. Um, the people of those days are, are really big into imagery. And, and they like to paint pictures when they tell stories and, and examples. They were big, real big on illustrations. Even Jesus used a lot of illustrations to get a point across. And a lot of times he would use what we call parables. And he would say the parable of the sower. You know, it wasn't a real person out there throwing seed. He was making an illustration of, of what the point was he was trying to get across. This is not a parable. This is not a fictional story with a moral, like a, like a fable, what they call Aesop's fables. Uh, it was a, a story with a moral, you know what I'm talking about. It, it, that's what a parable is. This is not a parable. He names the guy by name, so it's not a parable. This is a, a real event that took place. Lazarus was somebody who, who Jesus knew by name and the rich man. So this is not just some parable just to make a point. This is an actual event that took place. Now, it, it, I don't want to get too deep. Before the ascension of Christ, the ascension of Christ is when everything changed. Okay? Everything changed at the ascension. Uh, before the ascension of Christ, there was a place where the dead went. It was a big compartment. One big compartment. Okay? This place is... One big place with three compartments. Okay? The first one was called Abraham's bosom, or paradise is what we hear. Another was called Hades. And then there was a thing called a great gulf, or a great chasm, that was between the two. And, and the Bible said that these people can't go this way, and these people couldn't go this way. It's just there. There's no way to get across back and forth. But that's important. We'll get back to that. So... We look at, at what took place in here. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels. Now, I've heard that all my life and never really paid any attention to it, but it really is true. When a believer dies, God sends his angels to carry our souls to heaven. That's what he does. That what it says right here, that the angels came and carried Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. Now, you can preach a whole sermon on that and have fun mm -hmm. with it. The rich man also died and was buried. So, Lazarus lived a life as a beggar, as a sick person, hungry, miserable, wanting. He died and was thrown with, with no... Uh, Probably no funeral, nothing to, to, to elevate his name, something to remember him by, no, no uh, great legacy to, to speak of. They took him and they 
threw him in Gehenna. But now, but now, on the flip side, he's comforted. That's one of the things that it says, if you notice in that scripture, I'm looking for the verse. Hold on. Verse 16. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted. You see the contrast? See, before, the rich man was living in comfort, luxury, and, 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 and living it up. Lazarus was suffering. He says, Now, you used to have all the good things. Now, Lazarus is comforted. And you Hello. <laughs> Let's go back. So first of all, first of all, I want to look at this place in order to get an idea of the other place. In order to get a place to a look at paradise, we've got to look at Hades first. And and uh, I know we're, we're teaching on heaven, but you got to talk about Hades. you got to talk about hell. They, they go hand in hand. And uh, you can't have hell without heaven. You can't have heaven without hell. Uh, without one, the other one doesn't exist. you got to believe in them both. Um, so first of all, it's a place of misery. It's a place of misery. Read it. And he, hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented. You want to find the verses that tells you that there's fire in hell? A lot of people say it's just a dark place, that you go into the grave. And you go, no, this says that he is in torments, and he is in flames, and he is burning. That's what the Word of God says. That he is burning, he is on fire, and it ain't going out. One, if you remember, was begging for crumbs. Now he's begging for just a drop of water. It's a place of misery. It's also a place, and I think this is probably even worse than, than the misery. It's a place of memory. Look what he said. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things? He said, you remember that? And likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. I believe he knows. He remembers. Man, I got family up there. I remember how we used to sit up there and talk about how we was going to have a party when we got down here. No, Lord, I don't want them to come down here. Please don't let them come down here. Please don't let them send, send somebody. That he may testify to them lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. What was he saying? He said, they got the Bible. They've got the Word of God. Let them hear them. He said, oh, no, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now you talk about the power of God, the power of the Word of God, and he said to them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, if they don't listen to what's being taught in that Bible, it don't matter what kind of miracle you put in front of them, they're not going to believe it. They've got to believe that right. word. Right. So we looked at two people. Now let's look at the two places. Now, I'm going to use this word only for lack of a better word. There is what is called an intermediate Hades and an intermediate heaven. Now, let me say this before we get any further. This is not purgatory. There is no such thing as purgatory. Purgatory teaches you that when you die, you go to a place, and while you're in that place, it is possible for you to go either way. That's what purgatory teaches you. That's not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. That's what it says. There is no in between. So when we go to, when, when before Christ ascended, this is where people went. 
Okay? First, the intermediate hail, which is Hades. Revelation 20. Let's look and see what that says. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Revelation 20, 13 says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in it. Y'all see that? And they were judged every man according to the works. They were showed that they were not able to do, they couldn't work hard enough to get into heaven. No matter how hard they were. These are lost folk now. These are people coming out of death and hell. Y'all see that, right? So now we're just going to go back to where they came from. No, that's not where they go. Read on. And death and hell were cast into a lake of fire. A permanent death. A permanent hell. The place that was created for Satan and his demons. See, there's two places. This is the second death, is what it says. So what happened was when a non-believer, when someone who was, was not a believer in, in, in the Lord God, in the Old Testament, now we're talking about before the cross, resurrection, ascension, they would go to this place called Hades, which was an intermediate hell. At the great white throne judgment, that place will be emptied out. And they will stand before God and judged. They won't go back to there. They go to that permanent lake of fire. Where they will, what I call it, wailing and gnashing of teeth for eternity. That's what it says. Now, some people say, I don't believe that. Don't matter. I can say, God, so easy. Turn the phone up. I don't believe in gravity. Don't change the fact that it's gravity. You saying you don't believe it as if because you say it means it don't exist. And don't change the fact that hell is existing. And that there are people right now in hell who are in torments who would beg for one drop of water. An intermediate hell. Now there's an intermediate heaven. You say, now this is getting a little deep. Listen, we're talking about a supernatural God who has a supernatural plan for a supernatural people in a supernatural life. Everything he does is, is out, of, out of whack from what we think. Uh, I, I told y'all before I loved to listen to T.D. Jake some of his older stuff and, and uh, he'd always say God talk crazy talk he talked about stuff don't make no sense like he makes sense <laughs> you know he talks to blind folk like they can see uh, but let's, let's, let's read I'll show you what I'm Ephesians chapter 4 wherefore now, now here's where paradise gets moved okay Paradise is not where paradise was. Let me show you this. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. All those that were in paradise, in that place where Hades, the great gulf that was chasm there, and, and paradise. He took all those people and he took possession of them. That's what that captivity means. It didn't mean he held them captive. It means he took possession of them. All right? And gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's in parentheses. Y'all see that? I didn't put that in there. That's straight out of the Bible. That's a par parenthetical. It's what that's called. In other words, we're taking this statement. Now we're coming out here kind of explaining this statement. It's what we're doing. That's what he's doing. Keep reading. He that ascended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. He went down into the earth where paradise was. He took all those who were believers, Abraham, David, Saul, uh, anybody else that was saved before the ascension, when he went down, he took paradise and he took it with him. We studied last week to the north, to that third heaven, right? Remember we talked about that last week. So how do we know that Jesus is in paradise? Glad you asked. 
What did Jesus tell the thief on the cross? Today, you will be with me in paradise. This is where I'm going. And you're going to be there with me. So how do we know that it moved? How do we know that he went down and took this place and took it to another place? Glad you asked. 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 2. Remember we read this last week. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, right? We see that. Now we're not in the earth, not in the deep anymore. We're up in the third heaven where we talk about up in the north. We talk about that. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise is down to third heaven. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. He said, Jesus went down, he took all these saints, and he took them to the third heaven. What is the third heaven? Where God is. That's where God lives. And it leads us to the last points. There's two principles that I want to look at. And uh, listen, I, I, I've studied this out, listened to it quite a bit, uh, studied through David Jeremiah, which is where I'm getting all this, uh, or most of this anyway, uh, from his study. What do we look like? I, I don't know. You know, we, we don't have that glorified body yet. We're going to get that at the rapture. We know that. So what do we look like? I don't know. David Jeremiah had some different ideas about that. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that I agree or disagree. I just, I, I don't know. All I know is that we recognize each other. That rich man was in hell and he looked up and said, hey, that's Lazarus. That's Lazarus right there. I know him. So I believe we will recognize each other. And listen, I, I, I don't know if you if you call it paradise or if you call it uh, heaven or if you call it the Abraham's bosom, whatever you want to call it. As awesome as, as the streets of gold are, as awesome as the pearly gates will be and the crystal sea, and man, I can't wait to see my mansion and, and walk all over heaven and see all this stuff. That is not what is important about heaven. What's important about heaven is Jesus is there. You can keep the streets of gold. Keep the purpose. Just let me see Jesus. And that is taught all through the Bible. We miss it. I, I, really, until I, until I studied this, I did not see all this this many times. But the first principle is the priority of the presence of Jesus. Heaven ain't heaven without Jesus. It don't matter who all's there. No matter what saints is there. Who we get to talk to. I mean... Golden streets, what all is going on? If Jesus ain't there, it ain't heaven. Look at this. Let me read some of this. John chapter 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come in again and receive you into myself that where I am, there you may be also. He didn't say so I can take you to heaven and see golden streets. He said, so that where I am, you can be there also. Look at another. John 23. The thief on the cross, remember what he just told him? Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He didn't say you're going to get to see your family and get to see your friends and get to see some other folks that you've heard and read about. Them. He said, you're going to get to be with me in paradise. Look at another one. 2 Corinthians 5. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and what? To be present with the Lord. That's what heaven's about. It's about being with Jesus. It's not about all this other stuff. And that other stuff's good, and we need to learn that stuff. We need to study that stuff. And it's great to, to think about the golden streets and get to see our loved ones over there and get to meet some of the saints of old. But, man, it's all about Jesus. Philippians 1, for I am in a straight between two. Paul said, man, I'm caught between a heart, rock and a hard place. He said, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. He said, listen, if I just go be with Jesus, I'm happy. Wherever he's at, I'm happy. 
Just let me be with Jesus. First Thessalonians 4. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to what? Meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be walking on streets of gold. That's not what this is. So shall we ever get to walk through the pearly gates. So shall we ever get to reminisce with our loved one that's going to heaven. No. He says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Don't ever lose sight of what heaven's really about. All that other stuff is just, and, and I, I flip-flop this, y'all, and I'll explain why. All this is just the cake. He's the icing. I like the icing a whole lot better than I do the cake. I can just sit there and eat icing out of them. I don't ever do that. I don't ever do that. <laughs> I need, but listen, he, he's, he's the icing. He's the ice. He's what it's all about. The other stuff is just whatever. There's one more point. Permanence of personal decisions. We're going to go back to the point I made earlier, the verse we read earlier. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great goal fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He says, listen, when you die, if you're a believer, you go to paradise. You'll be with the Lord. If you are not a believer, you're going to go to Hades. But the point of that whole verse is you have to decide now. There's no flip-flopping once you get there. Once you die and you go to whatever compartment it is you go to, that's where you're staying. You don't get to change addresses once you get down there. You can't go to the post office and put a new, new address in. You can't change neighborhoods. You can't go visit on weekends. The decision that you make in life determines what happens in death. So the question is, as we talk Sunday night, time's running out. What do you do with the time that you got there? Texas, there was five of them that died at one time. Some grandparents and some grandchildren. I think it was great-grandchildren. Two grandparents, three great-grandchildren were in a vehicle trying to get out, and all five died in the vehicle trying to get out of the flood. Someone probably in their 70s, 80s, someone in their teens which says that God is no respecter of persons. The day you are born, God sets up an account for you. And he says, you've got this many days. This is it. You've got that many days. There is nothing that you're going to do to change that. Your days may be long and fruitful. You may live to be 80, 90, 100 years old. He didn't guarantee that. He said, your day is already numbered. I already have your day marked on the calendar. And no matter what you think or what you see or what you do, on that day, you will step into eternity question is whose neighborhood are you going to be hanging out in? 
you only have one chance. One chance. As awesome as heaven is, hell is just as terrible. Make sure you're ready. Make sure you're ready. Next week. We're going to be looking at the ultimate extreme makeover. What are we going to look like? I, and, and honestly, I haven't even had a chance to study it out good yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to get into this one. Just make sure before this night is out that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt in which place you're going because you're not guaranteed to make it through tonight. I said, I bet that those grandparents and those grandkids had plans coming up for this coming weekend. It was Labor Day. I bet they already had plans of where they were going to spend it, what they were going to do. Who says we're going to make it to Labor Day? Just make sure you're ready. Make sure you're ready. Father, we thank you for the day that you have.